G'day there. Welcome to lesson one of my Dynamo series for learning the basics of Dynamo. Today we're going to look at getting started and also the general user interface of the program. So uh, the first thing that people usually ask me is, do I need to know how to code to use Dynamo, um, such as Python, C Sharp, or C++, uh, or Ruby? Um, you may not know what any of those are, and that's okay, because um, no, you don't need any coding experience at all to use Dynamo. But of course it helps here and there. But for the sake of this series, you won't need to use code. So first we're going to just show you how, how to access Dynamo. So where, how, and what will you need? Um, so for the case of how I'm using it, you'll need Revit at the very least. I'd recommend version 2019 if it's available. If not, anything from 2016 and beyond will suit. <clears throat> so usually the first thing that people do when they search for Dynamo is they come across this guy. <clears throat> so what you'll need to do is search for Dynamo download. So if I go down here to download Dynamo, so we've got two versions here. We've got Dynamo for Autodesk Revit, which currently is at version 2.0.2. Um, there is a 2.0.3 release as well, uh, but it's still uh, not stable at this point. Uh, but it is the one I'm using right now. Um, this version of Dynamo is basically the core of Dynamo, um, which is shared between a lot of programs such as Revit, Alias, Format, Civil 3D, uh, but mainly Revit is what it's used for. And then you have Dynamo Studio, which is basically a sandbox version, um, which can basically be deployed without the use of Revit or buying Revit, um, but obviously has limited use. Um, you can always go to resources and go to builds as well. And this will actually show you all the old builds and all the untested builds of Dynamo or un unapproved for release. Um, so at the moment, a lot of people are running on 2.0.3. Um, but for this, for this tutorial, you could run on 2.0.2 .2 as the build. Um, sub build 0.2. Anyway, we'll move on. So that's how you can access Dynamo. And when you run it, it basically will guide you through the steps of installing it. I think by default, Revit 2019 comes with version 1.3.4 at the very least. Because um, usually people say which version. So I recommend 2.0.2 or 2.0.3 for 2019. And anything earlier than that, I recommend staying with 1.3.4 because there are some packages that haven't got beyond this version um, in terms of functionality. They all moved to 2019 after that. And there were some pretty major changes in how code works in 2019. Um, and you can download it just at this link here, of course, um, that I've just showed you. So we're going to actually open Dynamo. Obviously, um, this is the, the main step to getting into Dynamo is actually opening it. So typically it's under the Manage tab. Um, and if you just click this box here, so it's prompting me here with actually a version a version selection um, that looks, I guess, like that. You can see it on my screen. Um, so this is the great thing about Dynamo. You can run multiple builds at the same time. Uh, keep in mind that they may not share all their components. So it's usually good to build your scripts in one version typically and encourage your office to do the same so that you can all work together. In this case, I'm going to run 2.0.3. And once you've picked a build to run, until you close Revit, you can't pick another version of Dynamo to run in as far as I've been able to find so far. So Dynamo can take a little while to open sometimes because um, it is booting up. I'm just in a fresh Revit file here. You don't need to be in any special file in order to run Dynamo. It could be a family. It could be a conceptual mess. So this is the, the Dynamo home screen per se, um, which is, I guess, our safe space. Um, nothing happens on the home screen. There's no code executing at this point. So it's a friendly place. And obviously there's a lot of components you can see here um, available. Uh, probably the first ones to notice is just the whole right side is all dealing with reference training, uh, links to the forum, the website, GitHub repositories of people that are putting up their scripts. Um, so this is obviously just all, uh, I guess, guides and how to. So Dynamo is open source. It's a very friendly community. Um, so feel free to use these resources as much as you need. Um, but I guess on the left, obviously, is where we're looking at instead. So for the sake of this tutorial, we're only really going to do with new and open. And obviously your recent files will be stored here in a list as well, similar to most Windows programs. And you can also use these tools up here as well. Um, and also access packages, which we'll look at in a second. So uh, we're going to look at the scripting environment now. So we're getting a bit more serious um, with the tutorial. So now we're actually going to open the scripting environment itself. Um, so I guess by default, that is what it looks like. You may have something different around this zone here because I have some custom add-ons, which I'll run through shortly. Uh, but let's start with these two buttons, uh, basically. So we've got the the environment selector, as I call it, and also just what mode the, script, the scripts are running in. 
So by default, we're in automatic mode, which means that the script is always running. It's always recalculating itself. So most of the time, it's not suitable to be in this mode. Um, you only really can run in automatic mode when it's a very light script or when it's mostly dealing with arithmetic or mathematics. Um, so typically, it's good to go to manual. Um, I haven't typically used periodic because it's only for certain scripts uh, that do have uh, frequency based functions. So we're going to go to manual mode, which means that every time I press run, my script will rerun itself or update the, the values in the script. So at the moment, nothing is happening in the environment, which means until I press this, it should be quite fast to work here. This button here basically toggles between the graph view and the 3D background view. So this is my preview environment in Dynamo. Any geometry that I create with my script will typically be previewed here. Um, things may happen in the model depending on how my script is written, but sometimes uh, maybe until the very end when I tell it to do something to the model, it may just show me previews in this environment. So as you build lines, shapes, data, you'll see the result in this environment. And as you toggle between them, um, I'll just place a couple of nodes just so you can see how this script moves. So this is basically my coding environment. You can see as I move my coding environment and pan around, my preview stays. And likewise, my code remains while I toggle between them. Dynamo is quite similar to other Windows programs in that middle clicking will let you pan right clicking will let you orbit and spinning that the mouse will will zoom in and out so quite friendly and obviously in this environment uh, the same controls uh, middle click is pan and zoom in and out with the mouse will um, we're only in 2d so there's no orbit okay so that's the basic environment um, but we're going to look at a few coding terms before we go too deep into dynamo so that you can understand the jargon that a lot of people use when they train this program. I find this is something that people often overlook. Um, so this is a basic script, very basic. Um, five plus two equals seven. Um, there's a few components that use here. So we call these nodes, all these blocks of text or code or numbers, they're just called nodes. Um, so they're usually represented by a banner and then a body below that. Um, but if we, if, if we say node, we're talking about these. Um, inputs. Uh, basically what receive data and they always usually belong on the left of a node and they sometimes have an arrow sort of pointing like that which is showing the direction of the data flow through the script and then likewise we have outputs which are coming out the other end of each node so see these as a function uh, basically we're putting something in something's happening to it and we're taking something out once they come out, we connect these using wires. Uh, so these are basically strings. Um, it's basically what people might refer to as the, the spaghetti coding, um, because these can basically bend as nodes move around, which is basically what lends to the term visual coding. And then these strings are basically plugged into the inputs and the outputs uh, using connectors, which are usually represented by these circles unless you change your settings. Uh, data or program flow, as we call it, is typically in left to right. So we're taking our problem or our input and we're taking it out to an output or a solution. So we're always aiming to reach our solution by moving to the right in our scripting environment. And these arrows in inputs and outputs indicate how that works. If I'm talking about lists, basically a list of data is a group of elements that sit together in one packet or set of data. So you can see here I have a list for a range of one through to 10 with a step of one which basically means I want to step by one between the numbers one and 10. And I basically end up with a list of 10 items. Um, and you can see there that, that, that they also have indexes as well. So these are two lists that I'm showing here highlighted. There's a list length or a list count as sometimes it's referred to in certain nodes, um, which is how many elements are inside the list. So you can see, see here I have 10 elements in both of, the, of those lists. Um, but it's important to understand list index and position, which is basically which row of the list is the data sitting at. And it's important to note that lists always begin at zero. Um, people can get quite off put by working that way. Um, there's a few reasons for it, but basically every list will begin at zero. So the first item in a list is not at the first index, it's at the zero index. So it's important to note that. And even in a list with one element, there is still technically an index there of zero for one element on its own. Um, but that's basically the high level way of looking at lists. 
And then I guess inside the list, there are what we call values sitting in those indexes. Um, but we'll have a look at nodes very briefly. Um, just learn to do some very basic coding with nodes. We won't actually put any functions together um, because that's sort of going to be the emphasis of the next few tutorials where we actually look at how uh, nodes interact with each other. So on the, on the left here, I have my node library. So if I just scroll up to the top, um, and I'll keep away from here for now because these are all custom. Basically, these will represent an aspect of my library. So if I open up my, uh, let's say my list section, I can obviously look at my category, which is list functions, and my subcategory, which is things to generate a list. So let's look at, say, a sequence of numbers. So you can see here that this is basically a node. The moment I click here, it goes into my coding environment. And you can see here I'm basically being prompted to give some inputs to here. And if I hover over these, usually I'll get a description of what that input is. And sometimes I'll get a, a description of the output if it doesn't make sense um, as a just a short shorthand name. Um, but basically you can see here it's expecting a number or a letter to start the sequence at. So let's just say we want to get a number. So what you can also do is search. So I can search for number. And you can see here, this is the category it's coming from. Well, this is the subcategory, and this is the category it's coming from. So we're just going to go with this one here, which is a number. And let's just say we want to start at zero. So what you do is click your output, and you can see that it gives you this dashed line, which basically means it's expecting to connect to an input. So I'll just click there. So now these are connected. So see how these move around? Even if I go backwards, my string knows how to react to my positioning. It's important to try to keep your data quite neat when you work. From there, we're going to look at this value here. So how many numbers are in our sequence? And this again is a an, an integer in this case. So we're going to get an integer. Actually, we'll just get we'll get a number in this case. We won't deal with integers just just yet because it's probably a little bit too confusing to start that way. So we'll get five numbers. And what's our step? So the space between the numbers or the letters. And we'll just say for now that our step is one. If I run my script, basically my data has been fed into this node and I have an output. So what I'll do is I'll search for a node called watch. And you'll notice this time I searched by right clicking. So when you right click, you have a search here available. Um, typically, you'll find the more you use uh, these nodes, the less likely you'll need to go to the library to find them, because you'll learn the name of a lot of these nodes, especially the ones that you use very frequently. The one I've called here is a watch node, which basically all it does is previews what's coming out of your, your output. So if I run this, you'll see that it's showing me a list of what's happening. It's not actually doing anything with this data, it's just showing it to me. Um, likewise, if you're working with geometry, there's also a watch 3D node as well that will give you a mini display of what would happen if that thing became part of our environment. But we won't go into that one yet. So you can see here that basically I've got a list of five values starting at zero and they have a step of one. So you can see that the way that basic data flow works in those nodes there. But we'll probably leave it there and we'll look at arithmetic in our next lesson. So we'll just look at add-ons as well, because uh, Dynamo is an open source platform. There are people that author and contribute uh, packages for the software. So to find custom packages, basically you just go up to packages, search for a package. And if you know the name of the package you're looking for, you can search for it. Otherwise you can just sort by name and you can either just look down through them until you find something that looks like what you need. Well, sometimes you can actually search for what you're looking for. So let's say we're trying to find a way to deal with warnings in Dynamo. So you can see here, here I found one called Bang or Warnamo. Um, so Bang is built for Dynamo. It provides Revit warning utilization methods in 2018 plus. So this would probably be suitable. Um, and usually there's subversions depending on how up to date the package is, but usually the one closer to the top is the most up to date. And you can see that the dates of those versions release um, so it's a very friendly interface, and if you want to install that, all you have to do is click on install. Are you sure you want to install? Usually it will tell you that it has dependencies upon Python scripts or binaries, and this isn't an issue. It basically just wants to make sure that you're comfortable with uh, Python scripts being run on your computer, 
and in your Dynamo environment, which nearly always needs to happen. But someone else has written this, so you don't need to write it yourself. In this case, I already have uh, this package on here, so I'm not going to install it. Um, however, at this point, it would basically just go and download the package. I guess I'll just download one that I haven't had yet. So, a bunch of nodes for cleaning data. So we'll just download here. That basically just means download latest version. And it will basically just show down here and it will install. Sometimes it may close your Revit session. So just make sure you save before you go in there. But if you're lucky, it should just install. And I believe that that specific node package may not be suited for 2019. Oh, there it is. And it's already there. And you can see that they have similar structures to uh, a typical package in the main library. Um, and these basically basically are nodes people have written that usually have much more complexity buried within them, but they speed up obviously how fast you can get your data. So we'll just select those and delete them. But that's how you can get custom packages and you can manage them as well from manage packages and see which ones you have installed. And you can also go here and actually go show contents or show root directory and find where your, where your packages are located. And these can basically be copied. So you can copy this to another person's directory and it will basically act like the package is installed the next time that user opens Dynamo, which is how you can manage packages between users. So there's some that I would say are essential packages for Dynamo um, because out of the box Dynamo doesn't have everything you'll need. I guarantee it. Um, but some really important ones um, that just have really essential core functions are Clockwork, Archilab, Bakery, Medellical, Rhythm, and Springs. And the other one that I rate quite highly, which is specifically focused on Microsoft Excel data, is Bumblebee. Um, without these, I wouldn't be able to run many of my Dynamo scripts, so I highly recommend these. Um, some other really useful packages are Mantis Shrimp, which deals with Grasshopper and Rhino. Uh, files and some general packages which are Genius, Loki, Orchid, Steam Nodes, Synthetic and Zebra and then Lunchbox which deals with panelizing surfaces. Um, some of these you may recognize if you've worked in Grasshopper for Rhino. Um, they are sometimes the same packages just built for Dynamo instead of Grasshopper usually by the same people as well. And then there's some that are focused for specific tasks. So there's Bang which deals with warnings, Data Shapes which deals with user interfaces Elk, which deals with processing roadmap files, Ladybug and Honeybee, which deal with daylight analysis, and space analysis tools, which deal with shortest distance and optimal routes. Um, not all of these packages are necessary, but there's no harm in installing more than less packages so that you have them available when you search for functions. Because when you right click and search, it will also search through your custom nodes as well. But it's important that if your users are going to run your scripts, they also need those custom nodes available in their version of Dynamo. Otherwise, their script won't work. It will actually give them a warning saying that this function cannot be found and the script will fail to run. Um, it's important in Dynamo, if you're working on a large scale file, such as a site, you may want to scale your geometry. So you may get a warning sometimes saying that uh, your, your scaling needs to be increased. And simply the way to do that is under settings, geometry scaling. And you can just set your scale to extra large. That way it deals with the larger site. Um, it may work just a tiny bit slower, so only do it if you need to. You can also go in here to set your number formatting and some of your precision for how polished your geometry preview is in the, uh, the preview environment. And you can turn off edges as well if you need. Uh, and you can even turn off preview bubbles for, for nodes. Um, there's a lot of settings under here. You can change the way your connectors look. You can make them straight or curved. Um, I usually recommend curved. And you can do things to the background preview as well, such as turning off the grid um, or turning off the river background. There's a lot of options for customization in here as well. It's also important that if you go to help about, this will tell you the versions of Dynamo that you're running on which is quite important and it gives you a shortcut to the website. So just keep that in mind. Um, obviously there's a lot of help available as well, but the two best resources are the Dynamo Primer and the Dynamo Forums. <clears throat> so in principle, uh, I would say that the Dynamo Primer is a great place to start. Um, obviously follow my tutorials if you're interested uh, because I'll try and condense a lot of what's here into a, a linear demonstration, whereas this has a lot of information on how to use Dynamo um, without too many specific examples, but a lot of summarization of how things work. 
whereas the forums are literally people asking questions for how to solve specific issues. So it could be a node that someone's struggling to work with, or it could be a problem that someone doesn't quite know the solution to, um, such as how do I join parallel walls, um, some very abstract problems. Um, obviously, you know, like any forum, uh, be thoughtful, try not to waste people's time, but at the same time, uh, be polite, um, understand that not everyone has all the time in the world to help, but they'll do their best. So in the next session, we're going to look at arithmetic and data flow and actually set up some very basic scripts um, to test, test the coding environment and show you how data flow works. Thanks for listening today. Um, any questions, uh, feel free to leave them down in the comments below. If you're enjoying what you're seeing, feel free to follow and subscribe and hopefully I'll see you in the next lesson. Thanks. Bye.